People always say that good things come in small packages. Whether it's the diamond necklace, a new sports watch, or even the keys to a car, it appears that nowadays people prefer the smaller things. So how do we go about buying said small items with small plastic? Now, credit cards have been a fixture of modern transaction for a while, and at the same time, they've also become a key component of our modern day society. And that goes a long way when we consider the modern consumer world that we all find ourselves in. So when we think about credit cards, it's important to realize the history behind them so we can see how we've reached the point that we're in today. The modern credit card industry has evolved through ideological changes within the credit industry, as well as through technological changes to the card itself, which in the process have created greater um, consumer habits as well as creating greater consumer risks. So to encompass the idea of the credit card, we're going to look at three specific dates and then two corresponding eras that really show the implementation of um, the advances that occurred. So our first date is 1910, and 1910 marks the start of the first credit-like system, which was through Sears, Roebuck & Co., which is a department store, and they started offering lines of in-store credit to their most valued and wealthy customers. And that meant that they could go into the store, in one visit they could make a month's worth of purchases and pay for it throughout the month. And this is important because it created the two-party credit system. So with this little graphic right here, it's very simple. It was based on loyalty between the customer and the company. There were no interest charges. They weren't trying to make a profit. It was just a way for them to make big purchases and pay for them over time. And this set a precedent for about the next 40 years um, before the advent of the three-party credit system. So our next date is going to be 1950. But in between the time from 1910 to 1950, not a whole lot went on because of the Great Depression that kind of stunted any growth that would have occurred. But after World War II, there was like an upstart in economic activity. And we can see how that came into play with the credit card. So we have the Diners Club. In 1950, this is the first real taste of a <coughs> universal credit card. It was created by Frank McNamara, who is a businessman. And his idea was to create a network of the best restaurants in New York City and have his cardholders be able to use one card for all these transactions and have it um, come together as one organized bill at the end of the month. And from the article, Diners Club from the Historical Encyclopedia of American Business. We can see that his idea was to create a system by which customers could pay for goods and services without cash by presenting a charge card that would allow member merchants to secure reimbursement from a central source. So pretty much that essentially meant that he created the three-party credit system, which consists of customer, company, and an outside credit supplier. That meant that this credit supplier, like Diners Club, could give their customers a certain amount of money and they could use them at whatever um, restaurant within that network. And this shows a very big switch within the industry because it was a way for them to make profit off of lending and loaning instead of just a simple process of aiding their customers. So this is the start of profit in credit cards. Now our next date is 1958 with the Bank of America Bank of America card. And this was the start of the first general use credit card. So it was outside of the realms of specific travel and entertainment. People could use it at a restaurant or in a hotel, but also had a wider range of available merchants. At the same time, this is the first card to introduce revolving credit, which is a key component of our modern credit card right now. That means that at the end of the month, however much the uh, cardholder had spent becomes a balance, and they can either pay it off completely at the end of the month, or they can make a minimal payment, and then that, occur that uh, occurs, uh, their interest becomes um, occurred to that, and it goes on to the next month. And you can either pay it off in full, or you can make another minimum payment. So it shows that this creates an um, opportunity for people to buy items that they might not be able to pay off an entire month, but at the same time, there are some problems because it, it created some financial, personal financial issues with debt. And in David Evans' book, Paying with Plastic, he cites that the share of revolving credit in total consumer debt increased from zero in 1950 to about 4% in 1970, 16% in 1980, 31% in 1990, and all the way up to 44% in 2001. So we can see that this start of revolving credit created issues with personal debt. Now we're going to look at these two corresponding eras, our first one being 1958 to 2001. And so from here, we're going to talk about the expansion of credit card use as well as the issues that come with it. So in any emerging field, it's typical for there to be a little bit of slow startup time before consumers become you know, on the bandwagon for this service. And the number at the bottom, 73%, is another statistic from uh, David Evans' Paying with Plastic, saying that overall between 1970 and 2001, the percentage of households with credit cards more than quadrupled from about 16% all the way up to 73%. So this time is a major explosion of credit card use. We see, and the reason for that is, it's called the chicken or the egg scenario. So for credit cards to be successful, you need to have a wide base of cardholders as well as a wide base of merchants that are willing to accept that. 
So credit card companies solve this problem by mail soliciting <coughs> thousands of cards to potential customers to get them in their hands. This was controversial, but at the same time it was very effective. And consumers soon started to see the convenience and speed that came with paying with credit cards instead of having to use a checkbook or cash. Now, with this expanded use, we also have some risks that come up. So before we were talking about Diners Club or with Sears in the 1910s, this is a very elite group of consumers. But now they've been spread out to everyone. It's a less consistent clientele. People are more likely to overspend, um, start to create some personal finance problems with debt, and security issues like credit card fraud and identity fraud were also problems. Now, a societal impact on consumerism and compulsive buying from uh, James A. Roberts, uh, he has a, an article in the Journal of Consumer Affairs. He stated that um, to many, the money involved in credit card transactions is abstract and unreal. Because it's not tangible, people are more willing to spend when they don't have a physical piece of currency in their hand. And this is very problematic when it comes to heavy spenders. And our last era is the kind of like the new frontier, the last 15 years with applications of technology. So, E-commerce started off in like the late 1990s with eBay and Amazon where they allowed their customers to make transactions online with credit cards. This was very important because it also opened up other avenues for payment options. So in the payment options and services online article from Gale Encyclopedia of E-commerce, there was an expansion of available payments for not only online shopping, but also for paying college tuition, bank bills, utilities, and taxes. So we see that online transactions go outside the realm of just buying books or clothing, but you can use your credit cards to pretty much satisfy most of your financial needs. There's also m-commerce, which points to the mobile phone in the occurring age where um, it's the ubiquitous use of tablets or phones. It was a natural progression to take these online uh, transactions and put them on a phone through mobile apps or through just more usable uh, interfaces. And at the same time, there's more of a physical, tangible technological difference, which is the EMV chip, which has started becoming more popular in the last two years, where instead of swiping your card, you <coughs> insert it into the machine. And this just makes a more secure transaction. It authorizes and, uh, and verifies your information and kind of helps to prevent fraud as well as any online hacking issues. So that's where we stand today. It's definitely a big um, advancement from the early credit lines of the 1910s. And I ask you, the next time that you look to pay with a credit card, you can think about the big history that goes into using such a small piece of plastic.